morning, everybody. Isn't it a great Sabbath to be alive? Amen. Amen. Consider the alternative. (laughs) It's a great Sabbath to be alive, and it certainly is a pleasure to be here with you at the Upper Columbia Conference camp meeting on this beautiful academy campus. It's just wonderful. And uh, I'm excited to be here with you to spend a few moments talking about the Word of God. Uh, I'm very grateful to be rejoined with my colleague in leadership, uh, Pastor Hoover. Uh, We were sorry when we heard that he was leaving, but our loss is your leadership gain. And that's a blessing. And Upper Columbia will continue to go onward and upward. Uh, Last night, I also had the privilege of seeing my old friend and colleague in institutional leadership, Dr. John McVeigh, the president of Walla Walla University. And that was wonderful to see. It's good to know that John is here. And uh, Walla Walla is a great institution. I invite you to support it by sending your children to it. Come on, say amen, somebody. Um, In Adventist education, we are not competing with each other. We are seeking to complete each other. Thank you, sir. We are seeking to complete each other. And by completing each other, I mean we are supporting the mission of Seventh-day Adventist education. And it was wonderful last night, Pastor Hoover, to hear it mentioned and to hear the offering that you're taking to help defray some of the costs of Adventist education. Believe it or not, we actually try to keep the costs of Adventist education down. Believe it or not. No, we actually do. We really, really do. Okay, here, here is how you know that's true. Do you believe Adventist teachers are paid too much? In most cases, 80% of our payroll, 80% of our expenses are just covering staff, faculty and staff. So we, they are working on missionary wages, and they need your support. So please send our students, and let's continue making the advances we need in Seventh-day Adventist education, which by its very definition is transformational education. It's transformational. It does something that other institutions do not claim to do. Not only does it equip students with competencies in order to make a contribution to society, but it also works for life transformation. So that what we do on Adventist campuses is not just for four years, it's actually intended to Bless students for 40 years. That's what we're trying to do. With all of that said, brothers and sisters, I'm glad to be here once again and to let you know that I'm excited about this. Now, I I was given a little sheet of paper uh, that said that I was going to start speaking at 1130. (laughs) Now, I'm just I'm just telling you what's on a little sheet of paper. Um, Now. Um, I know, and I'm figuring in the great Northwest, and it certainly is beautiful up here. Boy, it's beautiful up here. Um, Just this past week, I had the privilege of driving cross-country starting Monday to Wednesday. I have a daughter who graduated from the Loma Linda University School of Pharmacy a couple of weeks ago, and uh, she needed to move to do her residency at Baptist Memorial Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. So I went out to drive with her, and I had a wonderful drive across country. The weather was favorable. We started from Riverside, California, and ended up all the way in Memphis, Tennessee, through Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas. And it's just, this is one, America is one beautiful country. It is one beautiful country. I tell people all the time, and I've traveled all over the world. I've visited more than 44 countries at this point in my life. Uh, None are more beautiful than the country we live in. It is a beautiful country, and we ought to get to see it and enjoy it as much as we can. And I thought when we got to New Mexico that I had seen big sky country until I came here. (laughs) Just this morning, you talk about big sky. I think that's 95 South I was driving, or I-95 South. Big sky country. It was wonderful. So coming in this morning, I was rushing to get here because I know that the sons and daughters of German immigrants and everything... Uh, <laughs> always start stuff on time. <laughs> all the Germans, all the Swiss, Scandinavians, the Danish, start everything on time. And then I looked at this little sheet of paper that said I was supposed to start speaking at 1130. Because <laughs> I'm from a community, how, how, how shall I put it? We're flexible about time. <laughs> 
just so you know, just so you know. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this work, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to get it complete, and when it's complete, it'll be finished. How's that? That's what it'll do. It'll be finished. That'll be finished. Um, I, you know, it's interesting. My mind plays tricks on me. It's full of stories. I spent so many years uh, as a pastor, teaching, preaching, uh, complete and finished. Um, there, there is a, a, it's an interesting distinction between those two. Recently in England, there was a, a, a group, just to illustrate the, the, the challenges of that term. Uh, recently in England, there was a group of uh, linguists who met, and they were actually uh, sponsored by the Oxford Dictionary, you know, with all the entries and all these philologists met, and they were trying to discover, they were trying to identify, uh, to, to delineate the difference between being complete and being finished. Isn't that interesting? Trying to figure, what's the difference? If I would ask you to define, what's the difference between something being complete and something? And you know they went on for hours and they couldn't figure out what is the difference. They couldn't do it in a way that clearly demarcated the fine nuances and distinctions between being complete and being finished. And so, um, finally, a Guyanese linguist stood up from Guyana. And he said, he said, I think I know the difference. And they said, okay, if you can define the difference, we got some nice things for you. You can have lunch with the queen. <laughs> we'll, you know, we've got a monetary gift. He said, here's the difference. He said, now... When a man marries the right woman, he is complete. <laughs> if he marries the wrong woman, he is finished. <laughs> <clears throat> But he didn't stop. He said, and if the right woman catches him with the wrong woman, he is completely finished. <laughs> so here's what I hope today. I hope in this sermon today I can be completely finished. How's that? I want to be completely finished. Uh, my, my dear friend, Pastor and Mrs. John Loma King, I saw them here today, and thank you for the special music. You'll get a chance to hear him one more time. Um, brothers and sisters, I do want to keep this brief because I think you're telecasting, are you not? Broadcasting? And is it true that it, it kills at 1230? Is that true? Yes or no? Come on. <laughs> I said only if you wanted to. All right, all right, all right. Okay, this is camp meeting, brothers and sisters. This is camp meeting, brothers and sisters. We only do this once a year, brothers and sisters. And if the spirit is moving, who am I to quench the spirit of God? Come on, say amen. <laughs> who am I to quench? Uh, let's talk a little bit, though, about a serious subject, the book of Revelation. You know, it's one of my favorite books. I spent a lot of time working in the book. I wrote my dissertation on Revelation. Uh, I studied the remnant in the book of Revelation. I wrote 800 pages on that one single word. Um, I tell you, God has a mission for this church that is just amazing. And our presentation... The way we are presented, the way God's people are presented in that final book of the Bible is nothing less than exhilarating and exciting, even though it's fraught with challenges. Today I want to come from the book of Revelation. I want to talk a little bit about the subject, blood and victory. How is that, everyone? Blood and victory. So, with that said, let's, um, let's bow our heads and offer a word of prayer. Dear Lord, not me, but Thee. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> the first broadcast aired on October 6th, 2000. But since then, Crime Scene Investigation, CSI, has quickly grown into one of the most popular television drama, police dramas in the world. CSI is, is built on a unique branch of forensic uh, criminal science uh, called Blood Spatter, Analysis. Now, many of you have watched this show. CSI, uh, criminologists say that this forensic technique, blood spatter analysis, seeks to piece together the events that cause the bleeding of crime victims. Knowing how a victim's blood landed on surrounding surfaces, they say, 
helps determine how a crime was committed. CSI has spawned a whole new style of television police drama known as the procedural, which answers the question not just who, who done it, but how was the crime executed? And since 2000, we've got a rash of these kinds of shows. CSI Miami, CSI New York, CSI Las Vegas. Some have survived, some haven't. Um, but whichever version of CSI you may happen to watch, one thing is certain. The science of blood spatter analysis reminds millions of viewers every week that spilled blood tells a powerful story. Now stay with me. Long before the first word processor spat out the original script uh, for CSI, careful students of scripture through their own blood spatter analysis discovered that spilled blood still tells a powerful story. For instance, the crime scene. A heap of stones stacked into an altar about a stone's throw from the glowing gate of a glorious garden. The crime? Murder. The motive? An emotional cocktail of volcanic rage, self-justification, and inexplicable hatred. And God himself launches the first crime scene investigation, and as he does so, he does it with a question. Where is your brother? You know, I like God's questions in Scripture because God never asks a question to which he does not know the answer. But the questions are often intended to drive us into self-reflection uh, self and even into repentance. Um, to Adam and Eve, who told you that you were naked? To Elijah, what are you doing here? To Ezekiel, son of man. Can these bones live? Now, if our text this morning was Genesis 4.10, we could tune in to the story of how Abel's spilled blood tells the story of blood and justice because the key text in the narrative of Genesis 4 is your brother Abel's blood cries to me from the ground. The story told by Abel's blood is that every murderer will face justice, sometimes in human courts, but always in God's courts. For with God, there are no cold cases. Now, if our text, another example, was Exodus 12, 13, we could revisit the night when the liberation of God's people from 400 years of suffocating slavery was ordained for a midnight visitation. Our spiritual ancestors slit the throat of the Paschal Lamb and sprinkled his blood <clears throat> on the three doorposts and, and the avenging angel who wafted over Egypt when the angel saw the blood sprinkled on every doorpost after he had sucked the breath of life from the nostrils of Pharaoh's firstborn, he would pass over every blood-spattered doorpost. And the blood on the doorpost tells us the powerful story of blood and mercy. It says that mercy is available, salvation is accessible, and deliverance is possible. But today, neither of those are the key texts. And I want to focus you then on a journey. I want to take you on a journey into a blood-red pair of passages one from Isaiah and the other from Revelation, which also describe how spilled blood tells a powerful story. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself, and he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp, a sharp 
sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress in the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Verse 16, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Powerful imagery. Powerful. But meaningless if its twin fails to be connected to its partner. The mirror passage in the Old Testament is taken from Isaiah 63, 1 through 3. And, I, and Revelation 11 should not be read separately from Isaiah 60, excuse me, Revelation 19 should not be read separately from Isaiah 63. So here's what we're going to do in this sermon today. We're going to take a journey into these two passages, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the practical application of these passages for every one of us who is seated here listening to the Word of God. Listen to Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 3. Who is this that cometh from Edom, E-D-O-M, with dyed garments from Basra, and this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? Now I'm reading from the King James Version. It was good enough for Jesus, good enough for me. I'm reading from the King James Version. I just happen to have the King James Version today. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save... Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me. I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. Two passages tied together by a theme, by a few common themes war, bloodshed. Victory. Isaiah 63 presents a scene from long ago in a land far away. A returnee from war in a distant country. He's coming back from Edom. And he makes his triumphant entrance into Jerusalem. The mighty warrior returns in full military dress, fresh from the sweltering heat of a pitched battle. In defense of his people, this warrior offered life and limb. But the image of this returning warrior arrests us because Isaiah notices that this soldier's army fatigues are not crisply pressed. His navy bell bottoms, not gleaming white. His Air Force blues, not iron creased and parade ready. But through the gates of Jerusalem walks a returning soldier whose uniform is baptized in blood. And the appearance of this blood-red warrior draws from Isaiah two questions. The first question, he directs to the admiring crowd. And the second question, he directs to the crimson-red combatant. Who is this that comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? And question two, why are you red in your apparel and your garments like him that walks through the wine press? Ladies and gentlemen of the Upper Columbia Conference, war, brutality, conflict defines human history. Nations, including our own, often employ force in the pursuit of national interests. Reggae legend Bob Marley, in one of his reggae songs, said, Everywhere is war. The brutality of war imagery is what stands behind this passage. But we have a challenge in experiencing the passage. Because in modern times, modern, meni modern media sanitizes war because it televises war often in HD. We've seen this in Libya. We've seen it in Iraq. We've seen it in Iran. We've seen it in Afghanistan. Television separates us from the sights and sounds of war. It separates us from the sights of headless corpses, 
from the sounds of soldiers' desperate gasps for their dying breaths. It separates us from the smells of the rancid smell of burning flesh. War is a symptom of sin's savagery, but sanitized because it is televised. However, go back to 800 B.C. In Isaiah's day, war demanded face-to-face -face proximity between combatants. There was hand-to-hand -hand grappling, axe fighting, long sword swinging, short sword stabbing, spike fist punching, hammer bludgeoning. Massive injuries were produced, cranial and facial fractures, puncture wounds and severed arteries with blood spraying and spurting everywhere. This war in Edom must have been a gurglingly, grisly, grisly, messy conflict. But that's not what Isaiah is focusing on. Somehow, in the midst of war's carnage, Isaiah, the gospel prophet, turns the spotlight away from the war to the war's hero. Isaiah sees a prophetic moment walking toward him. Who is this, he says, that comes from Edom? Edom is the land where the enemies of God's people dwelt. Edom, the land of red rock formations. Edom, home to the angry descendants of Esau. Edom, an enemy nation dedicated to the destruction of God's people. Edom symbolizes enemy territory. Today, Edom points to anything and any place dedicated to the overthrow of God and God's people. In these last days, Revelation 13 establishes that there will be end-time powers dedicated to the destruction of God's cause and God's people in the world. By the time we get to Revelation, Edom has morphed into Egypt and Sodom and Babylon, led by the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet in the end time. The text also mentions Basra the capital city of Edom. Basra is famous in history for supplying the red grapes for the dinner wines loved by the haute couture, by the beautiful people. So here's what we have in this passage. Here's what we have. Here's what we have, everybody. Stay with me. Here's what we have. Red rocks, red grapes, red wine, and a blood red war, and a red soldier. No wonder Isaiah asks aloud, who is this that comes from Edom? Who is this crimson soldier who fought so bravely in enemy land? Who is this blood-spattered fighter whose uniform is peppered with the condiments of battle? Who is this scarlet champion, champion who did hand-to-hand -hand combat with the destroyer? Who is this blood-bathed conqueror who hurled himself headlong into the garrisons of evil? Who is this red returnee who stood ankle-deep in the blood of of his enemies. Who is this blood soaked soldier who set the captives free? But before the crowd can answer, the crimson warrior speaks up and he offers a personal testimony because the crowd might get it wrong. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. I who tell the truth. I who am faithful and true. I who deliver my own eyewitness report from the front lines of battle. I who was embedded in the battle. I am mighty to save. Just in case somebody came to camp meeting this morning and did not know, may I remind you that God is still mighty to save. Now you may have come here today thinking that your situation is hopeless. You may feel like your circumstances are impossible. You may have lost your job this week or this month. You may have received a foreclosure notice this past week, this past month. Bills may be piling up. Your loved one may have died. You may be facing your sunset years in loneliness. You may have received this week a frightening diagnosis. Your health situation may not be good. You may be having a hard time financially. Well, I've got good news for you today. Heaven dispatched a crimson soldier, more skilled than an army green beret, more determined than a Marine Special Ops Regiment, more courageous than a Navy SEAL, more tactical than an Army Ranger, more deadly than Delta Force, and he is mighty to save. Does anybody here know what I'm talking about? 
Has there ever been anybody here who's been rescued from a set of impossible circumstances? Has anybody in this tent ever been saved? Have not two people been delivered? Heaven Crimson Soldier specializes in search and rescue operations. Summon any witness and they'll tell you. Gideon says he can rescue by many or he can save by few. Peter says he can rescue from a dark dungeon. Daniel says he can deliver from a lion's den. Esther says he can save from a death decree. Moses says he can save from a blood red sea. Hezekiah says he can save from a sick body. Nicodemus says he can save anybody. <laughs> Bartimaeus says he can save from blindness. Adam says he can save from loneliness. The lost son says he can save from restlessness. The lost sheep says he can save from aimlessness. The lost coin says he can save from uselessness. David says he can save from sinner. And Paul says, thank God, he can save from the saints. John says he can save in life. And Lazarus says he can save from death. Why? Because he specializes in reclamation. He specializes in restoration. He specializes in renovation. He specializes in rehabilitation. He specializes in re-education. He specializes from the uttermost to the guttermost. Thank God he can save. Now, if I were in a black church, I'd say, would you touch the person right next to you and say, stop worrying, he'll fix it. Matter of fact, why don't I do that? Would you turn to the person right next to you and say, stop worrying. Touch two people and say, stop worrying. He'll fix it. I love this. I love this. I love when my Caucasian cousins, cousins uh, I love when my Caucasian cousins uh, blush red, just like you did. I love that. I love that. I love that. But back to the interview. So now, in CNN fashion, Isaiah points his mic in the direction of the Crimson Red Soldier. And now, Isaiah asks the question that every blood spatter analyst in the viewing audience is dying to ask why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the wine fat listen to the answer now listen listen the crimson warrior answers in a stunning word of prophecy just when we thought he might say well it's because I stood shoulder to shoulder with my comrades just when we assumed that he might say, well, I was embedded with the infantry. Just when we thought that he might, like the war movie, say, I was surrounded by a band of brothers. The Crimson Warrior answers in words that are as painful as they are prophetic. I have trodden the wine press alone. And of the people there was none with me. I imagine that the soldier looks at Isaiah, but he looks past Isaiah. He begins to scan the horizon of human history. He says, I have trodden the wine press alone. This little phrase carries us 800 years forward, past Isaiah's day, to the blood-soaked sod of an olive garden. Verse 3 is a messianic prophecy. Where was this prophecy fulfilled? 800 years later, in a garden, where round two of the great war in heaven is being replayed. Remember, it's in a garden. In a garden, the disobedience of one cost us our salvation. 4,000 years later, the good news of the gospel is that the obedience of one reclaimed our salvation in a garden. Ah, but not cheaply. In this garden, agonizing spiritual warfare took place at a level that is inconceivable to you and me. Where a 33-year-old teacher who went about doing good withstands every attack of every demon in hell. So, hor so horrific is the war that no human tongue can portray it. No human mind can conceive it. It is so fierce that the moment seems eternal and it is so overwhelming 
that our Savior shrinks back from the price that has to be paid. He prays three times, Father, if it be possible. Listen to Desire of Ages, page 690. Can I quote Ellen White here today? You know, in some places, people don't want you to quote Ellen White. May I quote Ellen? I think it's safe here. Uh, I quote Ellen White, uh, Desire of Ages, page 690. Here's what she says. She says, three times in the garden has his humanity shrunk from the last crowning sacrifice. We should never think that our Savior won a cheap victory. Throughout eternity, my brothers and sisters, we will ponder his sacrifice, for there we will see the stakes. With undimmed vision, we'll have a grasp of what was at stake. The one who had dwelt in an eternity of eternal light, one who had received the unsullied and unspotted worship of unfallen beings across the entire universe, risked it all by draping himself in humanity in order to execute a rescue operation. And it escapes us. It is too grand for finite comprehension to grasp. And yet, it is the core of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we preach to the world. So he shuddered. He stepped back for a moment. But you know what pushed him across the line? Here is what she says. But now, she says, the history of the human race comes up before the world's redeemer. He sees that the transgressors of the law, you and me, he sees that the transgressors of the law if left to themselves, must perish. And then she says, he sees the helplessness of man and he sees the power of sin. And now, his mind is made up. She continues, he will save man at any cost to himself. He accepts his baptism of blood that through him perishing millions might gain eternal life. He has left the courts of heaven where all is purity, happiness, and glory, she says, to save one lost sheep, the one world that has fallen by transgression. Now, how many of you have been tracking with the Hubble telescope? The Hubble telescope, some of the images that have come back. The vastness of the universe is simply incomprehensible. And yet, against that vast canopy of dots of billions and billions of dots of light, against the inky black darkness of, of unending space, one of those little dots had strayed. And he loved that world enough to drape himself in humanity and to undertake it's deliverance. Watch this. Now she quotes Isaiah 63. She says, having made the decision, he fell dying to the ground from which he had partially risen. The Savior trod the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with him. It is Gethsemane that fulfills Isaiah's prophecy. There he trod the wine press alone. He agonizes alone. As our salvation teeters in the balances, where are his disciples? Where is the church? Where are the people who said that we will never leave you and we will never forsake you? Where's Peter? Where's James? Where's John? Just when he needs them most, they are off asleep. I suspect that right now at this age and stage of earth's history, just when God needs us most, in most places in the Western world, the church is asleep. And it's time for us to wake up to the opportunities to share the life. 
Gethsemane fulfills Isaiah's prophecy. Notice now, alone in Gethsemane, he agonizes with no human hand to comfort him. Alone in Gethsemane, where the whisperings of demon, demons tore through his soul. Alone in Gethsemane, where our Savior fights inwardly what he would later fight outwardly at Calvary. Alone in Gethsemane, where our crimson soldier shuddered in the chill of broken communion with God. Alone in Gethsemane, where he could have called 10,000 angels. Oh, my friends, today, if we would visit Gethsemane for just a few minutes a day in prayer, we could not resist loving him and serving him with all that we have and with all that we are. In the grip of Gethsemane, the world's spell would be broken. If we are gripped by Gethsemane, when we are gripped by Gethsemane, we will really not rush home to see whose idol is American or whose young is restless. In the grip of Gethsemane, we care little for whose housewife is desperate, whose throne is a game, whose blood is true, or whose life is a scandal. Gethsemane breaks the stranglehold of the world. If the world has us in its grip, let's go to Gethsemane, and I guarantee you, your heart will be changed because there you will meet in Gethsemane the one who paid the ultimate price. Why, Gethsemane lays human pride in the dust, for in Gethsemane our sacrifices seem so meager in the face of his great sacrifice. Tithing seems like so little to offer to the one who gave so much. By the way, Seventh-day Adventist, tithe is a minimum standard. You're not listening to me. <laughs> tithe is a minimum standard. It's the least we can do. It was never intended to be the most that we do. So notice now, in Gethsemane, she says, as he wavers, though, he hears the cries of a lost world. Swimming against the current, but sucked under by the riptide of evil, he sees you and me in the grip of Satan. Gethsemane, ladies and gentlemen, will break our hearts and bring us to our knees. It did that for Ray Overholt in 1958. He was a rising lounge singer with a very wonderful career coming out of Michigan. He was singing in all the clubs. He had been raised in Sunday school. He knew Bible stories, but he wanted his opportunity to catch the golden ring. And so he took his opportunity, a gifted musician, and he began singing and his career was rising. He began working in Vegas and other places, Ray Overholt. But the more he gained, the greater that emptiness inside began to grow. The donut hole, hole began to expand within his heart. And he said to himself, there's got to be more than this. So one night, he sat down and he opened his Bible and he began reading his Bible. And as he read his Bible, he saw that passage that said he could have called 12 legions of angels. And this is what Ray said. He said, I thought that that would be a good title for a song. And so this is the song he wrote. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They spat upon the Savior so pure and free from sin. They said, crucify him. He's to blame. Upon his precious head, they placed a crown of thorns. They laughed and said, behold, you're king. They struck him and they cursed him and they mocked his holy name. And all along, he suffered everything. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. His last verse, to the howling mob he yielded, he did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone. And when he cried, it's finished, he gave himself to die salvation's wondrous plan was done. Don't stop there. You've got to go to the end of the story. 
For it's not only a story of blood, but the gospel story is also a story of victory. Okay, here comes the teaching. Here comes the teaching. Before we wrap this up, here comes the teaching. Scholars tell us in verse 3 of Isaiah 63 that you see a common feature of Old Testament prophecy. They call this temporal telescoping. Here's what it means. In prophecy, two or more events are described in quick succession, often separated by a single comma in the same sentence. But in fulfillment, when they are laid alongside the slide rule of history, they can be divided by thousands of years. That's what we see in Isaiah 63, uh, Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. That's what we see. Notice now, it says, I have trodden the wine press alone. And now temporal telescoping takes place. For I have trodden them in my anger. That did not happen in Gethsemane. It did not happen at Calvary. I trampled them in my fury. That did not happen at Calvary. Their blood is sprinkled on. That did not happen at Calvary. I have stained all my robes. That did not happen at Calvary. In blood spatter analysis, the specialist would say, this pattern now that's being described in verse 3 is what's called a backspatter pattern. Here in verse 3, the former victim of Calvary becomes the aggressor at the end of history. By initiating action, the blood of the new victim now splashes backwards on the aggressor. Listen to me. Right here in poetic language, the Word of God telescopes us past Gethsemane, past Calvary, down to the end of time when the suffering victim of Calvary becomes the victor at the end of history. It telescopes us past Calvary when the suffering victim, the suffering lamb of Calvary becomes the lion of the end of history. How do we know that, preacher? Because in the last book of the Bible, John the Revelator picks up Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 63 and presents a final snapshot of Isaiah's crimson soldier. But in this vision, the soldier is no longer treading the wine press alone. He's no longer laboring under the weight of a lost world. He's no longer on hands and knees sobbing over our salvation. But the last picture of Isaiah's crimson soldier is saved for Revelation 19.11. And it reminds us of a story, not only of blood, but also of coming victory. Here are the points I want to make from this last passage. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. A white horse is a symbol of victory in the book of Revelation. Revelation is inundated with equestrian imagery. The first horse that gallops out of the first seal is a white horse, and the last horse at the end of the book that we see is a, is a white horse. And both of them symbolize victory. Revelation is important. It's a book not intended to scare the bejeebies out of Seventh-day Adventists because it has been used that way. But Revelation is intended to emphasize that God's cause and God's mission will overcome every enemy who seeks to, to, uh, to, to undo, to overcome, to destroy his mission and his purpose. You should know three things about the Revelation. First of all, number one, you should know that Revelation narrates the victory of the Lamb over every evil power. That's easy to embrace. Here's the second one that gets away from us sometimes. Also, Revelation narrates the complete decimation of Satan and his imps. Every time Satan appears in the book of Revelation, he's a loser. I don't know if you've noticed it. Every, in, every scenario, whenever Satan appears, for instance, in Revelation 12, there's war in heaven. Satan and his angels fight against the, uh, Michael and his angels. But Satan, what? He cannot overcome them, and he is cast out of heaven. He loses. 
Ah, but he becomes a smarter devil. This time now, he says, okay, what I'm going to do is since I lost in heaven, I'm now going to destroy the people of God. So immediately in 12, you see a cosmic woman and she's in labor about to give birth. Just as she's ready to deliver the man child, there is Satan, the jaws of like a gaping Komodo dragon ready to devour the child, but suddenly the child is caught up to heaven. Satan loses a game. Now he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to destroy those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. But this time he's smarter. So in Revelation 13, he walks over to the seashore and there he calls out to the sea and he calls up two creatures. Now a demonic trinity is formed. The dragon, the beast, the false prophet, they come up and now as a demonic trinity, he now gets ready to attack the people of God in Revelation 13. But when you come to chapter 14, where are the people of God? They are standing on Mount Zion, the 144,000. Satan is a liar and a loser in the book of Revelation. And therefore, we ought to have confidence. So now, when you get to Revelation chapter 19, what do you see, brothers and sisters? You see one more snapshot of final victory. And here is what you see. You see, mounted atop a white horse is the man of Calvary, seated in a victory pose, galloping out of heaven. Picture it now. This is the theme of Revelation. Christ is victory. Victorious. And notice what it says. Notice what it says. It says, the word of God says, and um, it says that he had a name written that no man knew. And verse 13, he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood. There is Isaiah's image. He's dipped in blood. The vesture. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the only other garment in Scripture that was dipped in blood was Joseph's coat of Genesis 37. And that coat was dipped in blood in order to perpetrate a deception on old man Jacob. It's an image that stands behind this vesture dipped in blood. But it's a contrasting image. Joseph's coat was dipped in blood to perpetrate a deception. Jesus' garment is dipped in blood to execute a liberation. <laughs> Therefore, that blood red robe says that we can trust him. Now, here's another piece of this image that needs to be emphasized. That blood red robe establishes the singularity of his victory. Now, please get this. Notice we've got a ruby red warrior escorted by a tsunami of glistening glory. Now the preaching's about to begin. A tsunami of glistening glory. The teaching is finished. A billowing wave of white glory led by heaven's crimson commander draped in a blood red robe. But notice now his angelic army is dressed in linen, clean and white. Why is the heavenly cavalry dressed in linen clean and white that's because the image is emphasizing that this is God's victory and nobody else's notice now there's no drop of battle blood on them why because the battle is the Lord's it's not yours it's not mine and therefore we need to stop trying to help God out it is his battle and not ours. Um, here's a news flash. Uh, he hires no associate saviors. <laughs> Heaven posts no position for an assistant redeemer. Um, there is no interim deliverer because the battle is the Lord. Stand still, said Moses, and see the salvation of the Lord he is God all by himself and he is big enough and bad enough to guide and to protect 
his church. And so this morning, I wish to invite all of the Seventh-day Adventist veggie saviors <laughs> to find a new mission. Stop getting on websites and pointing fingers at others and making anonymous accusations instead of talking to the very people that are being accused. So often what we hear, oh, I'm preaching now. So often what we hear is, well, they are not preaching the straight testimony. And in their little minds, this distorted concept of the straight testimony is a harsh laundry list of do's and don'ts. But guess what, everybody? The straight testimony of the true witness comes from the Laodicean message. And that message is an invitation from Jesus to his people to buy gold of me tried in the fire. In other words, <clears throat> the straight testimony is an invitation to stand wholeheartedly with Jesus Christ. When I stand with Jesus, I immediately stop judging my brothers and sisters. Rather than point fingers at each other, why not turn our eyes upon Jesus? Look full in his wonderful face. Man, the more I interact with our church after 35 years now, I know that this church is far from perfect. Leaders walk on feet of clay. Sometimes you make your best call after prayer and gathering all the information. I went to school to earn an MBA in leadership and organizational management, believing that if I just plunged into the leadership literature, I'd find leadership answers. And you know what I found? There was so much confusion and dissonance even in that literature. I learned that there are as many definitions of leadership as there are writers on the subject. So none of us are perfect as leaders, and yet it is because of that imperfection when we see the progress of the church, all of the glory goes to God. Uh, Dr. Calvin Rock, who is one of my mentors, was preaching at a camp meeting, and he was greeting people after he had preached, and he had bumped into one of his former classmates. And uh, the classmate walked up to him, hey, Calvin, how are you? And he began telling the story of how, yes, everything is fine. And so the classmate hadn't been around for a while. So he started asking, she started asking questions, said, so how is so-and-so? And asked about a classmate. And Calvin said, oh, well, he's doing fine. He's the president of so-and-so and so-and-so. Uh, what about this one? About, what about that one? Oh, yeah, but she's an attorney and she's working for the general conference. And the person just shook their head. Then, oh, so what about so-and-so? Oh, yeah, well, he's the president of the union. She shook her head. What about so-and-so? Well, that person there, they work for the general conference. They are in Silver Spring. She shook her head. And, and Calvin said at that point he couldn't bear it anymore, so he asked her, said, Sister, um, wh why are you shaking her head, shaking your head? He said she leaned on the post, and she said, Lord, Lord. With all these knuckleheads leading the work, it sure must be from the Lord. <laughs> now, right now, we got some big decisions to make, don't we, about women in ministry. I say let the sisters in so they can join the rest of us knuckleheads and we'll all be knuckleheads together. Come on now. <laughs> Trying to get the work finished. But that's all right. I don't mind that because you know something? It was just a few knuckleheads who marked around Jericho, didn't they? <laughs> it was just a few knuckleheads, just a few followers who had a foolish faith that believed that a crucified Galilean could divide time into B.C. and A.D. Just a foolish faith that believed that salvation was free for the receiving and, the world's relig and a world religion was born. It was just a few knuckleheads who in foolish faith believed that justification by, alone, by faith alone was enough to launch a reformation. Just a few knuckleheads, followers filled with a foolish faith who believed that a group of disappointed ex-Millerites could start a revolution that would encircle the world and the Seventh-day Adventist church was born. Just a foolish faith that believed that health was as much a part of the everlasting gospel and a worldwide network of sanitariums and hospitals were born. Just a foolish faith held by a few knuckleheads who believed that this church could grow an educational system. And today, we have 7,800 schools that wrap the world in light-giving SDA education. 
Today, as we stand here, 3,000 people are being baptized every day into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I don't mind being foolish if I'm foolish for God. Here's my last point. That rider on the white horse, dropped in the blood red robe, that robe shows, establishes the universality of his victory. Because notice now, that robe is monogrammed as a designer original. King of kings and Lord of lords. King of kings, he wears many crowns. One day we're told that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. Uh, an exiled emperor, as I close, an exiled emperor named Napoleon, he sat out one day on Elba, where, to which he had been banished, and he said, I know men, and I tell you, Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires, but upon what did we rest the creations of our genius? Then he answers, upon force. And now he makes a contrast. He says, but Jesus Christ founded an empire upon love. And at this hour, millions would die for him. Well, brothers and sisters of Upper Columbia, we're not talking about one of the great generals of history. I'm not talking about Charlemagne or Alexander of Greece or Leonidas of Sparta or Hannibal of Carthage. But we're looking for a crimson red general who will come galloping out of the gates of glory on a white horse. Can I just say a few things about him this morning? Ellen White said he's the center and circumference of our message. Can I talk about him this morning? They say he owned no servants and yet they called him master. He earned no degrees and yet they called him teacher. He produced no medicines and yet they called him healer. He founded no school, and yet they called him rabbi. He fired no guns, and yet he conquered the world. He committed no crimes, and yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, and yet he lives today. Can I talk about him this morning? <laughs> Somebody said he's a lawyer in the courtroom, and he's a doctor in the sick room. He's a way maker and a mountain mover. He's a heavy load carrier and a burden bearer. He's our bread when we're hungry. He's our water when we're thirsty. He's rest for the weary. He's hope for the dreary. He's our rock, our sword, our shield. He's our wheel in the middle of a wheel. Can I talk about him this morning? Yeah. Oh yeah, he was single all of his life, but he never violated his bachelorhood. When a woman taken in adultery was brought to him, he didn't say to her, meet me at my place at eight. <laughs> he said, no, no. He said, sister, Neither do I condemn you now. Go and sin no more. Can I talk about his master's degree? He mastered every academic discipline. He mastered geology when he created the world. He mastered dermatology when he healed a leper's crusty skin. He mastered hematology when he shed his own blood. He mastered kinesiology when he straightened out a palsied hand. He mastered oceanography when he walked on water. Can I talk about him this morning? He mastered meteorology because he stilled the storm. He mastered psychology when he settled the mind of a demoniac. He mastered necrology when he raised Lazarus from the dead. He mastered gynecology when he healed a hemorrhaging woman. He mastered pharmacology when he opened a drugstore in the hem of his garment. I said, can I talk about him this morning? I said, can I talk about him this morning? That's why the world cannot contain him. That's why universities cannot explain him. That's why philosophers cannot reframe him, and that's why poets cannot rename him. Can I talk about him this morning? Parliaments can't unseat him. Armies cannot defeat him. Beggars cannot deplete him, and computers cannot delete him. Can I talk about him this morning? <laughs> Prosecutors can't convict him. Landlords can't evict him. Okay, okay, I'm being careful now. I'm being careful. Democrats cannot predict him, and Republicans cannot restrict him. Can I talk about him this morning? <laughs> That's why historians cannot erase him. That's why Al-Qaeda cannot deface him. 
That's why Islam cannot displace him and a new pope will never replace him. Can I talk about him this morning? And if you need a miracle, his name is wonderful. If you need advice, he's a counselor. If you feel weak, his name is mighty God. If you feel lonely, he's an everlasting father. If you are conflicted, his name is the Prince of Peace. He is Solomon's rose. He is Abraham's ram. He is Jeremiah's branch, and he's John the Baptist's lamb. Can I call his name? His name, the Word of God, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the called of God, the sin of God, the way of God, the truth of God, the life of God, the priest of God. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. And here he comes, says John, not beaten to a bloody pope, not weak and emaciated by treading the wine press alone he's not faint and frail from the shredding of his back by the lash not bruised and beaten not a man of sorrows acquainted with grief not bearing the chastisement of our peace but here he comes says john a crimson general after calvary he earned a promotion a crimson general god's army leading sword wielding war making just judging crown wearing rod ruling nation striking horse riding crimson warrior and here he comes. And here's the good news. His victory is our victory. Because he won, we have won. He fought a, a titanic battle to save a dying world. Legions have come and legions have gone. But his victory remains. And ready or not, here he comes. Is there anybody here who loves him today? Is there anybody here who wants to be ready to meet him when he comes? When you love him, your priorities straighten out. God is first. Spouse is second if you have one. Children are third if you have them. Church is fourth. Job is fifth. When you love him, your mission changes. You live to minister to the people around you. You realize that an empty life is the acquisitive life, the life that constantly acquires and wants to get more and more and more. Ellen White says that everything was created to minister. When you love him, peace replaces restlessness. You don't care about what the Joneses have. Because you are not measured by the things that you possess. Often the Joneses who we are emulating do not possess those things. Those things actually possess them. So when you love him, peace replaces restlessness. Our hearts are restless, O oh God cried out Augustine, until they find rest in thee. And when you love him, you find the grace to accept those who have struggles in their lives. Here it is, Richard Seltzer. He tells a story, you know, Richard Seltzer was a famous Christian surgeon who saw spiritual lessons in his work. Here's what he says. He says, I stand by the bed. This is the experience he tells of a young woman who was his patient, where a young woman, her face, her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, in a clownish, in a palsy clownish grin. The tiny twig of the facial nerve, one, one of the muscles to her mouth, had been severed. She will be this way from now on. I had followed with religious fervor the curve of her flesh, I promise you that. Nevertheless, to remove the tumor in the cheek, I had to cut that little nerve. Her husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed, and together they seem to dwell in the evening lamplight, isolated from me. Who are they, I ask myself? He and this wry mouth that I have made, who gaze at and touch each other so generously, greedily. The young woman now speaks. Will my mouth always be like this, she asks. 
Yes, I say, it will. It'll be that way because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent. But the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. And then, unmindful of me, he bends to kiss her crooked mouth. And I am so close, I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate hers to show that their kiss still works. 2,000 years ago, Satan laughed at how his trick twisted our faces. He said to the universe, look at them, they're too ugly to love. But God had a plan. He sent Jesus, who saw us lying on the operating table at Calvary. Satan said they are ugly and useless. You couldn't love them. But Jesus said to him, the Lord rebuked thee. He leaned over your face and mine, twisted his lips to meet yours and mine, to show that the kiss of Calvary still works. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. I'm going to make an appeal today. And there are three classes of people that I'm going to appeal to. The first class are those of us who have been Seventh-day Adventists for a while. And we've come to appreciate, learn, and love this message. And yet, we want a deeper walk with God. We want to love him with an abandon that breaks the world's grip wherever it's still fastened to us. If that's you today, I want you to just raise your hand. Now I'm going to pray for you. Dear God, you have seen in this appeal those of us, and I join my brothers and sisters, who have been SDAs for a while. And yet there are times when we can feel the pull of the world. We can feel the tug of that other life beckoning to us. And today we're saying we renounce it. In the grip of Gethsemane, we turn over all that we are and all that we have to you. And you accept us. Your kiss has brought us to this place where we now surrender. And for that, we are grateful. Now, there's a second group of people who are here today. This group, they're also Seventh-day Adventists. But as a Seventh-day Adventist, you may have strayed for whatever reason. Someone may have hurt you in the local church. Someone may have said something unkind. You may have made a mistake and the church jumped on you in judgment and you felt alienated. And in your anger, your hurt, your disappointment, you began to move away step by step and you justified yourself by saying, it's only because of the way they treated me. And yet God never did let you go. When you were ordering your drinks, there was something inside of you saying there's still a better way. When you work those Sabbaths, God was saying, I still love you and there's still a better way. When you had that affair <clears throat> because you thought you deserved it, that emptiness you felt the day after, that was God saying, you can't fill that donut hole with anything but my grace and my love. And my kiss still works. I don't know how you may have strayed, but today you are saying, I'm ready to come on home. I've heard your voice. And so now every head is bowed and every eye is closed. 
And I'm appealing now to brothers and sisters who once stood strong in the faith, but who wandered for whatever reason and feel the need to reconsecrate yourself through rebaptism. That may mean restudy of the Word of God. That may mean having Bible studies. That may mean deepening your faith. But you're saying today, after listening to the Word of God and wanting to be ready, you're saying today, Lord, this is the moment. Today I hear your voice, and I'm not going to harden my heart. If that's you, would you just raise your hand wherever you are? You're saying, I want to recommit myself and reconsecrate myself. And if that means rebaptism, I'm ready to take that step. Are you here today? Where are you? Where are you? God has been speaking to you. And the message today says that the kiss of Calvary still works. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you. He's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, you who are with of God today? Is there someone? Would you like to join me by raising your hand and saying, I, I, I've heard God's voice. I need to make that step. God has been speaking to me and I've been resisting it. Now here's what Satan says. Satan says, no, 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 no. Don't do it now. <clears throat> Go home. Get everything straight. Tell him or her you got to move out. Um, wait until you get back to work. Tell your employer you're not going to work any more Sabbaths. Um, but what Satan doesn't tell you is that he is actually setting you up. Because the moment you get out here, there will be other distractions. And so today, today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. And you're raising your hand to say, I'm ready now to recommit myself fully. If your hand is raised, I want you to stand wherever you are. I want you to stand. Would you just stand wherever you are? If your hand is raised, amen, God bless you. You're going to make that stand. It's not a general appeal. It's an appeal for those who are saying now, I'm going to go all the way with God. I may have wandered away. That's okay. I may have wandered away. But I've heard his voice calling me to a deeper walk. Now I'm going to ask you to do something bold for God. I'm going to ask you to step quietly out into the aisle and to walk down front. And I want someone beside them to go with them. Just take the hand of the person next to you. Take the hand of the person next to you. And they're going to walk with you. Come meet me down front. Please, come meet me down front. God bless you. I see you coming. I see you coming. I see you coming. I see you coming. Where are the others? I see you coming. God bless you. You're coming. You're coming. God, take the hand of the person next to you. Just come. You want that deeper walk with God. That's the purpose of camp meeting. That's the purpose of camp meeting. You want that deeper walk with God. Amen. God bless you. You're coming for that deeper walk. It may mean rebaptism. That's okay. I was rebaptized. I was rebaptized. The second one worked, everybody. <laughs> the second one worked. <laughs> the second one worked. Is there someone else? God bless you. We see you coming down, Mother. We see you. We see you coming. Now I'm going to make one more appeal 
before John sings the last verse. Now you're not a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But everything in you says, I need to unite with this people of God. I need to unite. God is impressing me even in this moment, at this meeting. This is what I need to do. Where are you? Just raise your hand. I need to unite. I need to make that call. I need to cast my pledge. Is that you today? Where are you today? Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, when he's pleading for you and for me? And why should we linger and heed not His mercies? Mercies for you and for me. Let's sing that chorus together. Come home. Come home. Come home. Pastor Gultama, we will need to get names of the persons who have taken their stand. So would just a few of our pastors come down, and I'm going to offer a special prayer for you. I know that what you did this morning took great courage, but thank you for responding to the Spirit of God. I ask you to do it publicly because there's something reinforcing about standing up and saying this is what I want to do and I remind you that everything Jesus did for us he did publicly Calvary was public today I'll be praying for you because of the commitments that you've made and in eternity you will mark this day on your calendar and you'll say this is where my life turned around so let's bow our heads now. And God, we thank you. We thank you that you are still in the calling business. And that Calvary calls us to commitment and consecration and conversion. So bless these are our brothers and sisters who have taken the bold and courageous step of walking all the way down the aisle. And there may be others, Lord, who are struggling who today said, I, I, I didn't do it, although I know I should have. Now, Father, I'm going to ask you to give them no peace until they make their peace with you. Salvation is too valuable, it's too important to have it eclipsed by the cares of this life and by the things of the world. So, my brothers and sisters who are standing here, I pray your special blessing upon them Give them the blessing of fortitude, courage, and commitment. And then when you come, when we see you riding out of heaven on that white horse, may we and all of them and the lives that we all have touched, may all of those lives, Lord, be saved with us. Because that's really what we want to do. We want to see your face in peace. Everything else is secondary. Thank you. We love you, we bless you, and we praise you today in Jesus' name. Amen.